everybody to the March edition of our NDSU Extension High Tunnel Webinar Series. Um, now this is, uh, this is one of those talks that everybody has been asking for, uh, identifying and managing high soil salts in high tunnels. So we had sent out a survey to our stakeholders and overwhelmingly this was one of those issues that everybody seems to face. Now I'm very privileged to introduce uh, Terrence Nenick. Um, now he is a retired extension professor from the University of Minnesota and he's credited with pioneering the use of high tunnels in our region and he literally wrote the book on it. Uh, he authored the Minnesota High Tunnel Production Manual for Commercial Growers and he has just been a general friend to the industry. So we appreciate interacting with Terry and learning from him. I did ask him earlier this week um, whether he was more, whether he was busier than ever in retirement and he did say yes. <laughs> he in fact is the president of the Minnesota Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association. So he was responsible for helping organize um, that fantastic conference they put on every year. And he certainly, he certainly lectures all around the country. Uh, so we're very appreciative of your time. And thank you very much, Terry. Well, thank you very much, Esther. I hope everybody can um, hear me here. We have people on from long distances. Um, before I get started here, I just want to um, credit my colleague, Carl Rosen. Um, Carl and I have worked together for many, many, many years on, um, on high tunnels and, and fertilization and, and high tunnel salts, and we've all seen a lot. And this, you know, when we first started in the high tunnels, we figured, well, you know, we were coming up with a system that was pretty well foolproof. We didn't really have any problems. We were never going to have any problems. But um, since we really got going in the early 90s, mid 90s strong, um, we found out that that basically isn't the, isn't the case here. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, what I am going to talk about today, what, what we're going to look at here. We're going to start out with what are salts, and then um, we'll take another look at why salts accumulate in high tunnels. Um, why do they do that and maybe not so much in some of our fields? Um, and I know we have people on from all over the Midwest and there's some areas that um, have a lot more serious problem, um, especially with outside production than, um, than we do right where I'm at. But a lot of the growers I work with do have problems with um, salts and high tunnels. Um, so what effects of salts on plant growth? What, what do salts look like? Um, a lot of different symptoms out there. So how do we actually measure these problems? Um, we want to look at um, plant tolerance to salts, which ones can tolerate it a little bit better here. And then we're going to spend quite a bit of time on managing high tunnels or high salts in high tunnels. Um, so that's kind of what we, I really want to cover today here um, in the next hour or so. So Here's a picture of some salts. I don't think we any of us have a case that bad um, on the right there, but um, you know it doesn't take a case that bad to cause a lot, a lot of problems. Um, so let's look at um, some soluble ions in solution. That's what they basically are. Um, we have cations. Um, maybe those of you who remember chemistry a little bit remember that they're positively charged and ions are negatively charged. And it doesn't make a lot of difference um, as far as salts. <clears throat> In the name of the game here, they're, they're both salts and both can negatively affect growth in excess um, amounts. Now, um, salts actually occur all around us. Of course, life can't really exist without salts. But just to give you an idea here, um, it occurs in all natural water, even rainfall. Um, we look at salt water, and it will vary quite a bit in salt water from, from one geographical area to another around the world, but on an average is 4.7 ounce per gallon of salt in salt water. Now that's a lot of salt, but if you look at fresh salt water, or I'm sorry, if you look at fresh water, um, we're only looking at um, about two hundredths of an ounce of ga per gallon of salt. So there's very, very little in fresh water. Now that, that will vary around the country. 
So I highly suggest that, um, you know, um, some of you may be looking at FISMA and some of these other federal programs, but that's Farm Safety Modernization Act. But the, the, the truth is, um, you know, it doesn't hurt to, to test your water just to make sure that you're not in a freaky situation, especially if you're pulling off surface water. Now, what are some of the common salts that we have? Um, calcium, um, CO2, uh, pardon me, CA, calcium, uh, magnesium, potassium. Potassium's our nightmare in high tunnel production. I'm gonna talk quite a bit about that. Um, sodium, um, sulfate, chloride, bicarbonate, carbonate, and nitrate. Um, and some are, you know, more serious than others because of our use um, and maybe just basically how they flow or they infiltrate up in the soil. So that's kind of what we're looking at today as far as, you know, what are the salts? Now, you know, we have what we call natural salt accumulation. And basically we're looking at desert climates. And there's a lot of people who wonder, you know, what do we mean by a desert climate? Well, in agriculture, we kind of look at less than 20 inches of rainfall per year, which means that a lot of North Dakota and Western states are basically a desert climate from a legal um, definition, but not as we look at, you know, deserts as we think about vacationing in the desert or something like that. So um, it's soils that have limited drainage or leaching. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why they may have um, limited um, drainage, but whatever it is, we got to look at is the rainfall or added water in many cases that actually leach the salts out of there. Now, um, when water evaporates, um, we have an upward salt movement. And, you know, we can always talk about poor quality irrigation water, and if you are irrigating, I mean, you do have this problem, um, especially in, in Eastern Minnesota, you may wanna really look if on, um, have a test on your irrigation water. So most soils and waters in Minnesota have very, very low salt. And I say most, but we do have some problems in Western Minnesota um, in localized areas. Um, but as a rule in our agriculture fields, um, we really don't. But as you move west a little bit and the rainfall goes down, um, pH could go up and you, we can have some problems. So um, again, you know, testing is, is kind of the way. So let's look at why salts actually accumulate in, in high tunnels. Well, think about it here. High tunnels are similar to a desert climate. They may or may not get 20 ounces of water a year or 20 inches of water a year. Um, but in reality, they are shedded from rainfall. I mean, they are covered, so no rainfall or snow. The only water input is usually through irrigation. So we have to, you know, really think about how much we irrigate it and we can flood a lot of our um, salts out of there. Now, and so we have to manage to provide enough water for crop growth, but the, you know, we look at evaporation and transportation equals, you know, water input. So basically we're supplying this through irrigation. Now, a lot of people, they really technically run their irrigation very, very close. We use different tensiometers, whether they're electronic or some of the old fashioned type and don't really apply any extra water. Well, that water is put on. Um, some of the salts may be definitely absorbed by the plant for, for plant growth, but we don't have any um, infiltration of water taking this out. And I agree, it's a, it's a tough call sometimes because we don't want to evaporate or, or, or move all the salts down um, in the soil because a lot of them are very, you know, important for plant growth. But salts accumulate due to carryover of fertilizer, or different soil amendments, a mineralization of organic products. And we, we know, um, those of us that have studied soils quite a bit, 
know that the plants will not utilize 100% of what you put on in one year. So we are getting a little bit of carry over every year from plants not utilizing it, either through just basically being tied up in the soil or often maybe over fertilization. Um, one comment I hear a lot from um, growers is, these high tunnels are very, very profitable, especially maybe tomatoes and, and some of these other crops. And I'm going to over fertilize because it's cheap to put on an extra 20 or $30 or whatever of fertilizer, you know, in these high tunnels, of course, depending on the size of your high tunnel. But the truth is it can be detrimental because the plants are going to use it and somehow it's just going to accumulate. Um, evaporation wick cells upward. We usually don't have that much in trouble in high tunnels. Most growers are using some type of a plastic. So that, you know, helps there. And um, in natural systems, rainfall will leach the salts to lower depths. So what we're really saying here is rainfall or some type of irrigation, whether it's drip or going in there and flooding, really helps. Now we're going to see in a couple other slides here that that's not the um, only solution that there is. But let's take a look at um, effects of salt on plant growth. Um, what does it do? Well, salts or salinity um, reduces water uptake. We can see a good example here of the top um, plants. I think they're peppers on the right where they actually look like they're suffering from drought. And um, actually they're not. If you can look really close next to the plant, you can see that the drip tape was working, but the salts basically stopped the um, water uptake at least as much as they knew ne they need. So um, salt lowers the um, soil water potential that plants can, can take up or that they have. And so basically it's harder for roots to take up water. So. Now these ions, or salts as we call them, can accumulate to toxic levels. And pretty serious on that, we'll take another look at that here shortly here. But what are some of the things that um, we, can, we do? I'm stunning, leaf burn, wilting, curling. And this picture on the bottom here of tomatoes is one I see over and over and over again in high tunnels. People will call up and say, geez, the edges of my plant are, are burning or, or something of that nature. And you can see the browning again, you know, on the outside. Now, what I see, what really happens is people will go in there and fertilize extremely heavy and trying to get growth, they'll mix, the, they'll mix it into the top three to five inches. And they're actually causing a temporary, if I could use that word, high salts in some of their soils in the tunnels. So, you know, you basically want to make sure that fertilizer is mixed right. And a lot of people are, are moving to fertigation. We'll talk about that here in a minute here. But... Um, you know, that, that's the thing that we have to do, think about is prorating our, our, our fertilization throughout the season, sometimes in high tunnels. And, um, you know, it varies with species, cultivar, and growth stage. Germinating seeds are the most acceptable. A lot of you are probably in the agronomic business or outside gardening. And all the literature will tell you, keep the fertilizer, especially potash, and nitrogen at least two inches away from the seed. Well, there's reasons for that. There's reasons why companies, John Deere and, and Case IH have built machines that in, in their planting system with their discs and everything else that basically keep all that fertilizer, you know, away from the seed. And it doesn't take a lot of fertilizer, especially nitrogen and, and potash to um, um, definitely inhibit um, or destroy germinating seeds. Okay, so what are we looking at here? Again, um, as we look at the plants here, um, especially on the upper two, again, we can kind of see the damage uh, moving on to the outside of the plants. Um, you know, and we basically mentioned earlier that um, water uptake is often restricted. And of course, the outside of the leaves here, 
are basically the ones that are going to get the water the last. So they're going to basically start burning. Also, another factor is the cells um, that are being formed here to increase the growth of the leaves or the plants, you know, are basically, probably the easiest way to explain it, are extremely tender in the high salts, just like seed. It can, um, it can burn them and destroy them. Ooh. Now here we're moving on to um, the other type of plants here, um, cucumbers and peppers. You can just kind of see how cucumbers are extremely, you know, we'll look at this here shortly here of what plants, you know, but we, I guess the take home message here is when you see outside damage, um, you can be pretty sure that um, you've either got cells. Now, some people foliar feed, and we're gonna talk a little bit about foliar feeding, but we usually don't get too much damage from foliar feeding unless you just really, really excess it because of the, of the nutrient mixture in most, not all, but most foliar feed um, compounds. So how are we gonna measure these soluble salts? You looked and you seen some damage, or maybe, you know, you, you know, are just basically concerned, do I have any? Well, you can usually test them through a regular soil test if you ask. I see some of the companies like Ag Buys and, um, and Dairyland and them basically will automatically include that in, in, in a lot of their tests, depending on what you pay for. It's not a terribly expensive test, but anyway, so you collect the samples from the top six inches of the soil. We know that in high tunnels, we've kind of, at least in Minnesota, looked at about a nine inch test because of the um, small root structure of a lot of these plants in, in some of our high tunnels, but anyway, um, six inches will give you a lot more um, or a lot better reading than nine inch because it won't dilute lead it. If you take a six inch and a nine inch or six inch and a foot and you've got salts down that deep, um, you know, you could have some serious problems. So salts are measured with the con um, conductivity meter. Um, electrical conductivity is, is measured in milliohms per centimeter. And um, we won't get into the math there, but just kind of remember that it is numbers. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. So we submit to a, a soil testing lab and, we, and you wanna request, if you think you got these, a saturated paste soluble soils, salts test. Now, some of the labs, especially in Minnesota, Eastern North Dakota, will screen soil with the one-to-one -one soil water test. If the um, milliohms are under one per centimeter, then a saturated um, paste test will actually be run. So in a way, you really don't need to ask for it. But if you think you may have salts, it's always good to put on a soil test. I, I think I have salts. Um, you know, we want a very accurate test on that. So how do we interpret it? You're gonna get a number back on your soil test all a million ohms that basically tell you the amount of salt. And it's really interesting how they do test this. Um, technically, you can almost test it at home, but it costs you some dollars. But anyway, the, the numbers you want to be a, um, alert of is from two to eight. And with two, you basically have no problems, two or less. Now, that'll be for some of the sensitive plants that we're going to look at. Um, from three to four, some plants will be affected. Um, and if you get up there to five to seven, many plants are gonna be affected. And if you got an eight or higher, you're looking at extremely salt tolerance plants. Um, I think of asparagus. Um, when we were growing up, or I was growing up, my, my parents grew, grew about 35 acres of asparagus. And dad still had the idea when the weed problem got bad, you put a lot of salt down the row. And it did take care of the weeds, I'll say that. And it didn't seem to bother asparagus, but you know, when that asparagus got tore up, you had some problems. So trying to plant something else, or one of the things we always did is, is try to put another, um, some crop between the row, some low growing crop, and um, of course they wouldn't survive at all. So just kind of remember these numbers. Um, we do have some, some data we're gonna show you at the end and some publications where you can get a hold of this. But basically, for many um, high tunnel crops, uh, we're looking at two or less 
um, absolutely no more than four. Okay, so let's take a look quick at, at what crops um, are, are tolerant. Now, we actually took this from our um, nutrient management for commercial vegetable crops, fruit and vegetable crops manual. And this is online. If you just type it in, um, it has all the recommendations, not only for salt, which is only a page or two, but all the different vegetable crops as far as um, N, P, and K, limine, um, sulfur application, about anything you should probably need to know on fruit and vegetable crops. And of course, there's no, no charge on that. You can download it or just look at whatever page you want whenever you want it. Okay, I think we're back in business. Okay, let's look at um, soluble salts and what crops are we really kind of looking at here. Um, we're looking at um, blueberries, which we grow some in high tunnels, not a lot. Um, carrots, green beans, onions, radishes, raspberries, and especially strawberries, um, extremely, extremely, um, um, touchy. They need to be under two, um, preferably under one. Um, so you really need to think about that. I've seen many instances where people would try to put strawberries in the tunnels and the leaves are turning and I've seen it to the point that the strawberries actually just about die. They can barely survive. So that's um, important. And then we move up the scale a little bit and um, we look at three to four um, apples, cabbage, celery, grapes, lettuce, um, I'll make a comment on lettuce. Now we're getting all kinds of new varieties out there. Um, lettuce for restaurants and coming out of high tunnels getting very, very popular. And some of them are a little touchy at three even. So you just want to um, you know, do that and you can always put a test in. And one of the tests that I often use or tell growers to use is get some green bean seeds. You can do one of two things. You can either um, scoop up soil at a depth of six inches. In other words, you're taking the whole core up um, from zero to six inches, put it in a pot, put your green beans in there, and you'll yeah. see some drastic browning if, um, if the um, number is high. Otherwise, you can just plant some in, in the greenhouse between some other crops, and the green beans will show it before most of the crops. Um, again, um, peppers, potatoes and sweet corn. Um, we start going up the scale. Now you get, you get up in the five to seven, you've got some potential problems here. Um, luckily, um, you'll see tomatoes are in this group. Okay. Um, and cucumbers are in that group, which um, are probably the two most um, grown um, crops in high town, at least in our area. I know we're getting out to more and more crops all the time. But um, so anyway, you know, when if you've got tomatoes and cucumbers problems, you're gonna to have to take some, some drastic measures and you're also gonna to have to figure out why I got there. I mean, why in the world are, am I having problems? I'm getting it up to five or seven. And then I looked on the real high end, um, uh, you know, asparagus, um, Swiss chard. I don't know how much Swiss chard is grown, but um, I don't think too much. But anyway, they will really take it. And I, I have, you know, people who, you know, found out they couldn't grow strawberries that had to go back to some of these crops. I mean, um, and it's really interesting. The, um, some coal crops like broccoli will take it very high but cabbage and some of the other crops or coal crops won't. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, you know, like I say, you can always get this chart um, either online or, or just review this um, um, webinar that we're doing. Now, these are some of the high tunnels on our farm. We have seven of them. And I test them every year for salt. <coughs> now, you can look on the... Um, and it has some of the other fertility too, but you can look at the, at the high tunnels and high tunnel one was built in the mid nineties and it's been in tomatoes or peppers most every year. 
Um, this is one of our experimental tunnels, and we can see that the number is still under one. Um, we only have one tunnel, um, high tunnel five, that is up to 1.47, and I'm still trying to, um, to figure out why. If some of the help, <coughs> excuse me, possibly over fertilize that one or something like that. But you can see even after um, pushing 20 years in some of these high tunnels with proper management, you can keep this um, salt down. Now, if you're in an area that's starting with high salts um, before you build a high tunnel, then that's another situation that you're gonna have to look at um, for some type of um, correction. So how do we manage these salts or these soluble salt problems? Um, again, um, have your soil and water test it. <clears throat> and the reason I say your soil, because you know, we recommend that high tunnel producers um, do a soil test every year. And you can start to see it climb. I mean, some growers that you know, I work with, you know, it started in at um, one and next year went up to 1.5 and then 1.75, then two, and eventually ended up at around five or six. So, um, you know, if you test every year, you can kind of see if you got a problem with it climbing. Um, you know, you're going to have to, if they're high, they're you're going to have to look at, you know, some remedies. Um, again, um, locate your high tunnel on a soil that drains well. We teach that in some of the basic classes. Um, use crops in the rotation that are, are salt tolerant. Um, some of the coal crops, um, you know, some of the cover crops, but like I say, tomatoes are probably, tomatoes and cucumbers are probably one of, two of the, I should say, two of the um, crops that are grown mostly in high tunnels. And when you've got problems with them, you know, it's getting pretty, pretty high. Uh, I did mention <coughs> plastic mulch before. Um, it does reduce evaporation and reduces salt accumulation on the soil surface. Um, with that said, I've been on growers farm where they actually taken the plastic off and you can actually see the salts on top. So, um, you know, probably a case of over fertilization with the wrong products. Avoid over application of nutrients. Um, well, you know, try to do it by soil test recommendations. Some of the labs we're working with, with um, you know, we realize that you're going to be taking a lot more crop off. We're going to show you some slides on that. Crop off in, in um, high tunnels versus um, field production. Um, again, I will say in our neck of the woods, um, high tunnel salts are mostly due to over application of fertilizer, but not always. And just because you're organic does not mean you don't have any problems. Um, we'll talk about that here shortly too. Um, compost is a big thing here. Um, manure compost salt levels in a Michigan survey, um, you can see were really high. Uh, minimum was, was two. Um, average um, 5.7 would put you on the um, edge of almost growing tomatoes. And of course, the maximum was 23. Now we feed a lot of animal salt. Um, I should say we see we feed all animal salt at, at some level. Some manures are a little bit more touchy than others. I think of beef manure because of you know the high salts that they accumulate, um, and or I shouldn't say accumulate, but um, consume, and basically the <coughs> excuse me the um, small amount of grain in that that they eat. So basically, you know, when I talk about beef manure here, I'm talking more about the cow-calf type of manure rather than the, you know, the feedlot, you know, type of manure. Um, um, we haven't had any trouble with horse manure in a lot of our research, but um, you have to remember when you compost something, and manure is very, very common, or you really want to compost it, but it does concentrate things. You know, you start out with a great big pile and by the time the composting process is over, it's really condensed, it's really went down. So them salts have really, you know, um, concentrated themselves. So just something to think about. I am not telling you to 
not to use compost and manure because it's going to be hard to, to, to get really good yields without it. I'm not saying it's impossible. A lot of people say, well, I'm going to get around this by using plant compost. Well, that is one aspect of things. But on the other hand, um, the manure, the compost from manure, you know, is usually a lot more valuable as far as the amount of nutrients that you, you can really get out of them. Now, one thing that they used to say a lot of years ago is, you know, get this stuff composted fast. We're going to add some um, nitrogen to it. We're, you know, maybe um, we're going to try and build up, you know, some potash. So with the nitrogen, you're actually adding salt. So just remember um, that because, you know, when we put this compost manure in a high tunnel, we're doing it at high levels. I mean, you only put it an inch or two deep, um, sometimes a little bit more, but you start looking at that at, at tons per acre and multiply that out, you're putting it in there pretty heavy. And so I'm just kind of keep that in mind. Gary, okay. we do have a question in the chat box from Vicki. Can the pH levels in your soil indicate salt concentrations here? To a certain point, yes. Um, usually the higher pH soils will definitely have a tendency to have um, more salts. Um, basically because the flip side of that is basically because the sands um, have uh, more water go through them a lot easier and sand won't hold on to the ions as much as the, as the heavier soils. If your pH is, is really high, and by high I'm talking you know, seven and a half to nine, I'd, have, I'd be concerned. If it's you know, seven, even seven, five, I wouldn't worry too much about it um, if it's outside production. You know. So I hope that helped a little bit. Um, oh, another question from Randy. What type of compost, plant or animal, was surveyed in Michigan? That was, that was plant. I'm, I'm sorry, that was animal. Okay. And like I say, that's where you're probably going to have your, your problem. I doubt if you're going to have any problems with plant compost, unless you would put a lot of them urea on or something like that to try and compost it in a hurry. Um, so if you are using high salt compost, um, analyzed for nutrients as well as salts. Um, we actually did quite a bit of um, manures at um, Crookston and we really didn't see a lot, but um, again, it, it, it can happen. Um, again, to answer your question, compost with high salts are usually manure based, unless they're really fertilized heavy in, in a plant um, based compost to make a compost a little bit better. Um, and you know, you, you're definitely going to want to probably use um, some manure um, based fertilizer, especially if you're organic, but um, you know, just don't get too carried away with it. Now, if you want to be technical, we say, you know, apply, you know, based on nutrient content. Usually nitrogen, if manure compost has 10 pounds available per ton, apply 10 to 15 pounds an acre, which is only 688 pounds per square foot. Now, if you look at our nutrient management guide, it does give you the pounds per ton of compost and regular manure um, of different animal species. And that can um, definitely make a difference. But if you really look at a, a tunnel, okay, if you look at a tunnel that's um, 20 by 100, that's 2,000 square feet. So that means you're gonna be putting somewhere in the neighborhood of um, what, 1,700, six, seven, 1,400, um, or a little bit less manure in that whole tunnel. Now, that isn't a lot as compared to what I've seen, you know, growers use. So again, I, I would run a test on it. I mean, I think they're kind of pushing this a little bit more than we need to, but, um, you know, it um, is something you really need to be aware of. Um, Plant-based compost, low salt can be applied at higher rates. But again, you know, you almost got to double it to get the same amount of nutrients. And again, it would depend on, you know, what, what plants you're looking at versus what manure you're looking at. But I haven't ever seen any trouble with, um, with plant-based compost. The biggest problem I've seen with plant-based compost, to be honest with you, 
is herbicide concentration. And I know the seminar isn't on that, but I've seen um, um, people go out and intentionally either take hay or something and compost it, or worse yet, from the city compost. And um, the lawn owners, they often apply a lot of um, 2,4-D or, or some related chemical on there. You compost it, it's really concentrated. So that's where I've seen most of the problems with um, plant-based compost is, is basically in the area of, of herbicide damage. And that's a tough one because sometimes all you can really do is dig the four out of your high tunnel out to, a, to six inches to a foot and replace it. So let's look at where the problems is. Inorganic fertilizers, um, you know, we have, we want to use lower salt fertilizers. Now we have here, uh, most of these products are one that um, we use in what we call commercial fertilizers. Um, but where, where's, the, where's the problem here? Well, I look at ammonium nitrate coming down here at 105. Well, you can't even buy ammonium nitrate in Minnesota anymore, basically because of the um, problem with it blowing up. So, um, you know, that's really not too, too available. But so you look at some of these, they're, they're in the, in the um, 60 range as, as a rule. Um, but you get down to potassium chloride, which is 0060, which is basically a big component of vegetable crops. Um, you know, you're looking at 116. So you can see using straight potassium chloride or even mix, like going down and buying some um, 19, 19, 19 from the local um, fertilizer company. I'm sure they're using potassium chloride because of the, of the cost in, in their fertilizer mixes. Well, a couple of things here. You can see that it's, it's pushing almost double, push, uh, pushing almost triple the one that down here that says potassium sulfate, which is another form of um, of potash. So basically, um, potash is going to be your number one problem as a rule. Now, nitrogen is um, can be, um, but we found out that potash is our is our real problem. Now, here it is. Potash is the real problem that we have at least with commercial um, agronomic potash. The real problem is potassium chloride has a salt index of 116, which is about the highest. It's often the most demanding nutrient. Now, back in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, we did studies on, this was done actually at Crookston, but we, we did studies with what's the fertilizer use of different crops. Um, we basically worked with tomatoes and cucumbers. We wanted to see, you know, um, what the soil tests were before the season, what the soil tests were after the season, and, you know, which ones were the, were the problem ones. Well, when I teach this session here, it usually goes on about an hour, so I just pulled a slide or two out they show you what the deal was. And I think this was, we were running about 40 to 50 pounds of plant of Cobra tomatoes that year. Well, we can see before the season, and this is at a six inch depth, and we actually did test down to um, 24, but we won't probably have time for that today. But you can basically see the potash level when we started with 1349. Now that's just really off the chart. Um, but we can also see after harvest, we were down to 173. So basically the plants basically used all them, all that potassium to basically produce that crop. Now that's a pile of potassium. Of course, you start getting up there towards the 50 pounds per plant. I mean, that's kind of, you know, a little higher than most growers get, but again, this was a research project. You can also see the nitrogen, which is basically, um, um, went up at 263, you know, basically used well over 200. I don't know why this phosphorus number stayed the same. That's a mystery, but phosphorus is usually not a problem because of the little salts. So 
what are we looking at here? We look at tomato fertilizer used for a 40 pound plant of product. And you can see um, you know, what the fruit uses, what the vine uses in total. So basically what we're required to produce this crop is um, that's about 100 tons per acre outside, 600 pounds of um, nitrogen, um, only 80 pounds of phosphorus, but again, 940 pounds of, um, of potassium or 1,128 pounds of K2O as most of us buy it on the open market. So we can see where that runs into a problem. Um, so how, what do you got to do if you're just using straight commercial fertilizer that could be high in salts? Well, in a 26 by 96 high tunnel, and you can do the math, of, you know, there's 43,500 square feet in an acre. Um, you know, we're looking at um, a little over 20th of an acre here. So what do we got to put in that tunnel to produce that 40 pound plant? Now, I'm not saying everybody goes out and fertilize this because you're probably not getting 40 pounds. If you're getting 20 to 30, you're probably doing pretty good. But here again, you're going to have to put 64.29 pound of K2O or equivalent in a in the in that soil mix. You know, only 10 and a half pounds of um, I think we use 1846O or 1152. I can't remember. And you know, almost 30, not quite 35 pounds of um, of actual nitrogen. So it does take a lot of fertilizer, and that's part of our other problem. I want to talk about nutrient uptake. Um, you know, two things, basically, I want you to remember, first of all, it's got to be there. And that's the problem. We know we can't produce top-notch, high-quality, high-profitable crops without fertilizer being available to the plant. And two, it's got to be in a water solution. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on these scales here, but um, we, Carl and I worked on this here, and basically, you know, um, this is here the, the pounds per acre of, um, of tomatoes and how much weekly N and potash you basically need. We didn't do the phosphorus on this slide because, but you can see as the, um, the daily, as the plant gets up into here, in the 71, 91 days, 92 to 112, where you're, depending on the variety, of course, where you're producing a tremendous amount of tomatoes, you're harvesting every day, you can see what the uptake basically is. Um, we also um, broke this down here. This is just for your information here. Um, as per 100 square feet in four foot rows. Um, so basically, you know, most of our growers have tunnels anywhere from 50 to, you know, several hundred feet. So you can kind of easy figure this out here. The only problem here, the question is, what do you basically use? Now, several years ago, I had the opportunity to work with a, a major company on premix fertilizers. Now, for that chart that we had a long time ago um, in this presentation, we talked about, you know, different fertilizers, um, which ones have low salt, intra, you know, um, low salt um, content, that whole ball of wax. Well, the whole thing is, if you're going to follow that and do that, it takes a lot of work. You may have several different types of products you're using. Um, so, so the companies are saying, geez, this high tunnel deal is going to be really big. I think I can um, profit on this. So, you know, what can I do? Well, so we went to a lot of premixed fertilizers that are probably going to solve some of your high tunnel um, salt problems that you have them. First of all, um, you got to buy the right stuff. We're going to talk about that. I'll tell you, it's not going to be the cheapest. Um, we usually look at great greenhouse grade things because greenhouses, um, we're dealing with seed germination. We're dealing with um, very young plants. And these products will contain very low salts, at least on you know the salt scale. Okay, so we're looking at you know what I call premixed high tunnel fertilizers. 
Um, <coughs> there's, a, there's a company here, and there's several others now. I'm not going to get into a lot of different ones called Plant Marvel. Um, that's the one that I basically work with. And we came up with several low salt fertilizers that are um, of different nutrients that you can either apply at different times or just use a basic 20-20-20, um, depending on what your soil tests are, that are extremely low in salt and they're mixed and they also contain all the uh, micronutrients. And again, I throw this here um, back of the bag, I always you know, read the directions on um, that type of thing. That doesn't mean you can be careless. It doesn't mean you're never gonna have any salt problems, but we can actually go ahead and, and drastically reduce them. So um, what, what are we doing here? What, what um, products are, are in these here? Um, we look at uh, urea ammonium, but we also have to have a little bit of calcium nitrate in there. Potassium nitrate is gonna be the big carrier for, for potassium. Um, we have soluble sources of organic fertilizers, um, fish emulsions. Um, just make you're going to sure you're going to get one that's going to go through the drip tape here. And I'm um, looking at a at a fertilizer. Um, <clears throat> I'm one of the national teachers for the Farm Safety Modernization Act, and we're spending a lot of time on on different fertilizers and and, and um, how they basically not only affect growth. But, you know, what's the um, situation with, um, with um, organic problems, as, you know, as far as um, human safety is concerned? And a lot of this is going to come out, but make sure that fish emulsion has basically been treated and it's not raw is all I can say at this time. So, basically, um, you know, if you will look, uh, most recommendation for N and potassium or N and K are basically um, in pounds um, per acre. Um, we're, I'll say we broke them down into ounces per linear feet. So uh, on, on some of these bags, they do give you a, a real good thing, but using them product as a rule of thumb, you're not gonna have to worry a lot about salts. Okay, um, these are some of the mixtures that are available from different companies if you wanna get technical about it. Um, you know, um, we look at transplants from day one to seven, we have a high phosphorus fertilizer. Then we want to grow it out from, you know, a week to about 30 days, a low phosphorus fertilizer. And then at first flower again, we're looking at, um, you know, high pot, high, higher potash. Their plants are really putting on big amount of growth and, um, and high phosphorus because we really want to make them things bloom and that type of thing. Then once we really start um, getting producing, um, that type of thing, we're looking at um, a common fertilizer that's um, higher in potash, um, nitrogen, low in phosphorus here, and the same with um, growing to the end of the season. So you can kind of manage things with this, um, but it's still gonna take a lot of nutrients here. And a lot of people will just go in with a, with a, a straight triple 20 of, um, that's put together right and um, they can get by with that. Um, but you know, definitely watch your soil test. What if the plant growth is poor, but the soluble salts are getting high? Um, we do have some options, but th there's not a lot. Um, we look at, you know, leach the salts out. One thing you can do is um, remove the covering and let rain leach nutrients out. You can also go in there with a sprinkler. Um, Post-harvest irrigation with drip. Um, one thing that we do is we really run the drip heavy um, for a week um, on and off, um, sometimes two weeks at the end of the season and just kind of flood things. It, it, I think that's one of the reasons why some of our soil tests aren't as high as I would like. Um, but it takes a lot of water to do this. Now look on the bottom of this slide. We're looking at the amount of water can be substantial to be effective. So um, in six inches, um, to leach out 50% of the salts in the top foot, um, in six inches of water, 12 inches to leach out 80%, and 24 inches to leach out 90% of the salts. 
Now for each inch of water that you're putting inside that high tunnel, if you're using a sprinkler, whatever situation is, is 623 gallons per thousand square feet. So it isn't a thing like you can just run a water hose in there for five minutes and you think your problems are solved. It's gonna take a lot of water. Um, now, this is one of the reasons why people with um, high tunnel problems and salt have basically run the rows on the same, run the plants on the same rows every year. I know you can talk about um, disease problems and other things, but they can take the drip tape and um, get a lot of water on there. So basically, it does take a lot of water, you know, to leach these out. But again, I mean, what we're really looking at is. Um, you know, in the first six inches of soil here that we really want to take care of. So, <clears throat> um, so apply an early season application of good quality water, fill the root zone, and leave cells from the upper six to 12 inches. This is why we highly recommend um, running the irrigation um, heavy the minute they're transplanted or basically before, depending on, you know, how soon you're getting into your high tunnel. Um, Use shorter irrigation intervals. Keep soil moisture levels higher between irrigation. It dilutes the salts. Now, you know, a lot of you who use tensiometers say, well, you know, I'm not going to kick my tensiometer on until it's 40 or something like that. Well, the soil's getting dry at 40, 50. So if you've got salt problems, you're probably going to want to think about kicking it on about 20 and keep them soil moistures high between irrigation and salt salus. Now, I've had one grower that I work with, so basically what we ended up doing during the growing season, um, after we saw that problem, is kicking on his drip tape for about 45 minutes to an hour every single day, and the plant pulled right out of it. But they were relatively young, they showed it right away. Um, again, you can use sprinkler irrigation, um, takes a lot of water. Um, we have to realize that leaching will also um, leach nutrients, so you know don't over apply here. Um, again, what are the, the causes? Um, lack of rainfall, high amounts of fertilizer. Um, I didn't really get into a lot on, um, on um, fertigation, but this is the one reason why we try to fertilize at least on a weekly basis. And there are very inexpensive ways you can do that without going to a several hundred dollar system. But, um, you know, you, so you want to fertilize what you think the plant is going to need. If you don't do it all at one time, at least you're going to get some, some plant um, uptake. We do a lot with um, soil, or pardon me, with leaf analysis. But on the other hand, um, you know, that isn't going to give you a, a pure reading either. So again, a monitor with a simple soil test. Um, the bottom line is if you've got high salts, you're going to have to use um, irrigation or some type of ways to apply water in excess of the crop needs. And we kind of recommend that you do it with a plan after you build the high tunnel, kind of start it, don't let them build up in the first place do your soil tests every year and just kind of monitor them. Um, you can remove the, the um, cover in the fall. I mean, the one thing that we do is, you know, you have to replace this plastic every so often. So we try to take it off in the fall when we're going to put it back on in the spring. Um, and the thing with salts, too, is the continual application of water that takes them down. It isn't putting an inch on and then letting the soil dry out, put another inch on. It's, it's the continual wetness and the continual saturation of water in the soil that really takes out these salts. And again, a monitor the salts don't over irrigate if they're too high. Um, on your list here, there's some other um, publications that have worked with salts. Um, my colleagues um, in Pennsylvania, um, all over have done a, a really good job here. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Take a look at some of these if you um, have some time. Um, there's quite a few on here that um, that I put on. So, um, any questions anybody has? I see we got about five minutes or so left. You are welcome to turn on your microphones. 
So Scott, if you can enable people's microphones, or if you do not have a microphone, you know, please type your question in the chat box. I am not seeing any questions in the chat box. This is your chance. Don't be shy. If you think of some questions here down the road or as you're ready to fertilize your tunnels or if you do have a problem, feel free to drop me an email. Well, the other thing I would think of, you know, here in North Dakota with with the abundant snowfall we've had at least in eastern North Dakota is that we could certainly haul, you know, shovel some snow into the high tunnels too um, and have that melt. So that's, that's another possibility too. So is there anybody here that has had or has seen problems with uh, salt in your high tunnels? I guess I'm not seeing much for questions here. Okay, well, we hope everybody had the opportunity to learn a little bit today. And uh, as tunnels become more and more popular, um, we probably will run into these. So now's a good time to um, educate yourself and kind of do some prevention every year. Yes. And then, Terry, I know that you're running some Food Safety Modernization Act trainings across Minnesota. Are you doing about four of those? No, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, Esther. Uh, now, are you running some Food Safety Modernization Act training in your state? Yes, we are. We've done um, three already, and we have one um, next week yet, I think, and that we're going to finish it up. And then um, toward fall, we want one in um, the Fargo-Moorhead area. Oh, and, great. And um, I think we'll, we'll have one, you know, maybe – in Alexandria. We haven't decided the locations, but we got to start doing a little bit more with the western and northern parts of the state. Yes, absolutely. And, and in fact, this is a major issue for us here in North Dakota, too. Um, so we are having Produce Safety Alliance Grower Training, and that is being, um, being conducted by Connie Landis Fisk at Cornell University cooperation with Julie Garden Robinson from NDSU and Holly Mobby from Dakota College. So this is a really important issue for us and we do have the training on April 5th from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. in Jamestown and it's only $25 which covers the cost of meals. Um, but an, an extremely important training for us. Now if you are interested in registering for this training you could google NDSU Field to Fork and um, that's right on the website. And I'll also send out a reminder to everybody via our listserv. If you're not on our listserv, you know, send me an email and I will put you on the list. But this is so very important with all the new federal regulations regarding produce safety. Um, and it's just good practice to know what the good agricultural practices are. Right. And I will add to that, Esther, that um, there is a, a, a basically a $25,000 um, threshold that you sell under that. But we actually have been having a lot of smaller growers um, attend these that want to keep their produce safe. Um, if you have produce that's in, um, contaminated with um, bacteria or something, it doesn't make any difference what size you are. So, um, you know, all the growers should think about attending. Yes, it really is insurance for everybody to know what the regulations are and how you can be in compliance and, and how you can be a good producer. And then uh, are you also covering um, the basics of manure safety and, and, and you know, when that can be applied? Yes, definitely. Matter of fact, I'm the one that actually teaches the session on what we call soil amendments. We get into a lot of manure safety, which is a big thing with um, compost, how to compost, um, you know, some of the dangers of raw manure. The program is not that hard because there's only certain crops that are covered um, un under the law. I mean, if you're looking at um, sweet corn or asparagus, um, some of these crops that are not frequently consumed fresh, 
are usually not covered, but that don't mean you can't have any problem with them. That's exactly right. Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions here, but thank you so much, Terry. This was just really beneficial. Um, I know this is a huge issue across North Dakota with both our high pH and our high soil salts that we have and combining that with our fertilizer salts, it makes for, for quite an issue in both North Dakota and South Dakota and Western Minnesota. But thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and um, we hope to we hope to sponsor you again for, for further webinars in the future. We always enjoy having you. Okay, well, thank you very much and good luck to everybody that's on here. All right, thank you everybody. And if anybody wants to be on our list serv but isn't, you know, Send me an email, or you can certainly type your email in the chat box here. Thank you, everybody, and have a good week, and stay warm and dry. <laughs>